everyone. Welcome to our last session of the day. We Okay. <laughs> Keith Backard has been developing free software since 1986, working on the X Window system, the Linux kernel, and rocketry electronics. He's currently a distinguished Linux technologist at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, working as the chief architect for Linux on the machine. Uh, Keith received a Unix Usenix Lifetime Achievement Award in 1999 and O'Reilly Open Source Award in 2011, sits on the X.org Foundation Board, and is, and is a member of the Debian Technical Committee. He has spoken at numerous free software events around the world, including LinuxCon, the Plumbers Conference, LinuxConf Australia, FOSDEM, Fizzle, Guidec, Academy, and OSCON, among others. Please join me in welcoming Keith Packard. And thank you very much. I know I'm at the uh, last talk of the day, and I stand between you and beer, and so I will assure you I will not run long. Um, as he said, I've been uh, working on free software for a long time. Uh, recently, I kind of got interested in uh, the, the topic of randomness. I know we've seen a, a few talks at LCA on randomness uh, in uh, Auckland. Uh, we had a couple of people talking about uh, one RNG. I don't know if uh, any of you were there enjoying that. Pre yeah, see, there are a couple of people. Um, in any case, uh, it turns out that randomness is hard. On the, on the um, left side here, we have a, a, an image that actually is generated, uh, st stochastic, chaotic, totally random image. On the right side, it's not so random. Uh, what is on the right side? Anybody see that? No, huh? Well, that's actually an image of pi. If you, if you stare at it appropriately, and I can, I can see if you practice a bit, there, there are two dots at the top there to help to align the image, uh, but it's actually an image of pi. So it's, it, it's got a lot of data in there, a lot of content. Hardly random at all. Um, of course, randomness is necessary for the security of our machines. Uh, we use it for TCP ISNs, we use it for SSL keys, we use it for uh, GPG keys, we use it for a lot of things in our world. And real randomness is really hard to come by because we spent the last 50 years building very deterministic machines that don't do anything random ever. Um, uh, in, in, in fact, it's useful even for things like uh, Monte Carlo simulations. If you're trying to do nuclear weapons research, you need a lot of real randomness. If you're trying to do neural net training, you need a lot of randomness. Um, the problem is, when, you, when you're trying to find randomness, all you can ever do is find non-randomness. You, you construct an algorithm that looks for patterns in your data. You can construct a million different algorithms to look for a million different kinds of patterns in the data, and you'll still miss things like this, right? Anybody want to try to feed that into a, uh, random, number, uh, a random number detector and see if that right side image is not random? Well, it's not. But I, I can assure you, I ran that through uh, Die Harder. And it said, oh, yes, that's completely random. Um, of course, one of the things you really want to use randomness for, as I said, is cryptography, uh, one-time pads. Uh, the problem with one-time pads in World War II is that they had people generating one-time pads by hand on typewriters. Right? You think, OK, just hand somebody a, a piece of paper and a typewriter and say, please type randomly on this piece of paper. Well. After about an hour of typing, the people got really tired of really being truly random. They started like alternating hands, right? It still looks really random. You're picking keys from alternate sides of the keyboard. But there was enough data in that to be able to break the one-time pads used in World War II because people are not truly random, which kind of sucks. Um, here we go. Uh, in, modern, in modern days, we look for non-human sources of entropy. Um, uh, here's, here's things that have been used actually in random number generators you can get on the net today. Uh, obviously, people get uh, random noise out of the, out of the ether by uh, turning, on, turning on radios. Uh, 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 decay of uh, radionucleotides is also a really good source of entropy. A little clicks in your Geiger counter, those are really, really random. Um, there's actually somebody who has a, a webcam pointed at a lava lamp uh, as a source of entropy just the melting of wax in your, in your lava lamp. And of course, there's a really famous one the fish tank watching fish swim around. It's a good source of entropy. There's actually a, a student somewhere who actually roll dice for you and enter, ran, enter the dice rolls into his computer, and you can pay him for entropy. All of these have been used for sources of entropy, for randomness in the, in the internet. And, because, and people do this because it's really important, right? As I said, if you want to, if you want to generate a new GPG key, you need a, a steaming pile of randomness. And, for most of us, our computers generate only a few bits per hour because you know they're sitting there with an SSD. Well, that's not random. 
They're sitting there not listening to the internet because uh, you're desperately trying to generate your GPG key. And the only randomness they have is you, and you're sitting there banging on the keyboard and ha ha ha, just like World War II, you're not very random. <laughs> so it kind of sucks. So we look for other sources of entropy, and this is the source of entropy that uh, B. Dale and I found, um, uh, the, the humble little diode. It turns out if you reverse bias a PN junction um, and drive it over voltage, as you head off that cliff on the right hand side over here, I can actually, whoa, don't do that to me. I'm sorry, I'm using my phone here and it's the first time I've ever done this. But um, yeah, as you, as, you, as, you, as you head off this right hand side over here, um, uh, the, as, as you have that reverse bias voltage, you'll get uh, electrons just uh, occasionally breaking loose from the, from the or, or holes, charges in any case, uh, breaking loose from the, from, the, uh, from the crystal structure and cascading through the, through the material. And it'll bump into other stuff and you get this kind of cascading uh, breakdown effect where you get a cascade of charges and so you get this loud click every once in a while, just randomly. It's a, it's a, a quantum effect because of the quantum nature of charges and you get that uh, bunching of randomness um, that occurs, that kind of clumping, and so you get this, uh, these random clumps of charges that are very difficult to determine because they're basically a quantum, uh, a level of, uh, an effect that's happening at the quantum level of the silicon. And so that's a really nice source of entropy. Um, we're using the, uh, we're using uh, the PN junction of a uh, 2N3904 transistor. The reason, the reason we're using that little transistor is because the, uh, the reverse bias, the breakdown voltage for that transistor is only six volts. If you look at like a 1N, you know, 1004, the old classic diode, the breakdown voltage for those is, I don't know, 70 volts or something. And you really don't want to generate that much voltage in your little tiny uh, USB key. So we're using the, a PN junction, the base two emitter junction of a, a 2N3904 transistor, which is about six volts, which really works nicely. Okay, I didn't want to spend a huge amount of time on entropy um, just, because, um, just because that's not really a focus of the talk, but I wanted to show you how, what, what a simple idea we started with. It's like, I want to capture this data and I want to produce a device and be able to sell it to my friends, or give, it to, give it to really good friends. Um, uh, and I want to be able to uh, you know, solve this problem of a significant amount of randomness that I can really trust in my Linux environment. As I said, it's critical to the security of our systems. You want to have a system that you really do trust. Okay, so here's our basic chaos key plan, right? I want to be able to generate a, a noise source, uh, feed it into a system on chip and pump it over USB. What's the system on chip in the middle there for? Well, it's, you know, classic. Your classic embedded computer, you have some collection of devices and you wire them all together so you can do a bunch of software and save yourself a pile of hardware. We could, of course, have built this entirely custom. You can imagine a little FPGA uh, program to talk to the, uh, in hardware to talk to the noise source and have a little USB uh, thingy going on in that. You could make this, make this look a lot like hardware. Um, of course, this looks really simple. How hard could this be? <laughs> yeah. Well, BDL was a really nice guy. He's a patient, patient hardware engineer. He has actually a degree in electrical engineering. Um, I have a degree in mathematics. Uh, oddly, that's a long ways from electrical engineering. Um, he decided to just kind of stand back and mildly smile and watch me go about my way, <laughs> play with electronics. Um, also, what I did learn is that my techniques that I've learned in a few years of software development uh, really don't entirely carry forward to hardware development. What's the mantra of software development? Release early and release often. Um, well, yeah, it takes like two weeks or so to go from, oh, I have a new design in my hardware to, oh, I can now test it on my bench. So this whole release early and release often, well, if I did two designs in a day, uh, then I'd have this two-week pipeline before I can test them. Well, it takes a long time. Maybe you should have somebody who's had some experience, and BDL's that person who's had the experience with figuring out how to make this work. So here's our first hardware plan. Uh, BDL found this little, um, the little Zener diode. The Zener diodes don't generate um, uh, breakdown, uh, this clumping noise, but they do generate shot noise. As the charges uh, cascade through the Zener diode going backwards, they generate a little tiny bit of noise. Uh, the nice thing about a Zener diode is you can find somebody who's, uh, find one whose breakdown voltage, which is kind of the Zener voltage, is a lot lower than that six volts. And in fact, he found one at 1.22 volts, which is even smaller than 3.3 volts. So I don't need to generate any crazy voltages in my device. Uh, so we're gonna feed a 3.3 volt supply across the Zener diode, amplify it and compare it, and spin that into my system on chip and, and, uh, and spit it out the USB port. Awesome, seems pretty straightforward. Problem with that design, the design was that the, the, the Zener diode that he found wasn't actually a Zener diode, it was kind of a synthetic Zener diode. 
And I don't, we, we never really successfully characterized the shot noise that it would generate. It probably would generate shot noise, but it was such a low amplitude, and we ended up amplifying it so much that it was difficult to distinguish the noise of the device from the noise being uh, in, input from the rest of the environment and the inherent noise in the, in the SOC and the amplifiers. Um, so we really never got this one to work. And BDL asserts to this day, and I'm going to believe him, uh, that he could make this work, that he could make this work. Um, he, of course, at the time uh, got busy. He got uh, re rehired by uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, went, went to play with a machine, um, and had a great deal of fun. And I was like, well, I guess I can kind of carry on on my own. Uh, but I'm never going to get this one to work because this one's like hard. Uh, let's do something simpler. Um, about that time, we showed up in Auckland, and the one RNG folks were, were showing their stuff. Um, and they showed us a, a really simple noise source that had been used in um, innumerable projects. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little more about that in a few minutes. Um, so the other thing, of course, about the system is we need to have an SOC. You want to be able to have a processor to do all the communication. Um, and you want it to be cheap and small and low power and blah, blah, blah. And in my particular case, I wanted to have something that I already had a tool chain for. Um, and so, I'm, of course, we picked an ARM because you always pick an ARM. Um, we heard last, uh, in the last presentation about how ARM scale all the way from tiny Linux systems to huge Linux systems. Well, it's kind of funny. In my current job, I'm building probably the largest ARM system I've ever heard of with 320 terabytes of RAM and 80 processors and, you know, steaming piles of everything. Oh, and in my other job, I'm building kind of the smallest ARM system I've ever heard of. Um, this thing has, um, it's a 5x5, five five, so that, that chip is 5 millimeters square has 32 pins, it has 32 kilobytes of flash, and uh, four kilobytes of, of, uh, of RAM. Uh, we use this chip in a bunch of our other Altus Metron products. We use it in a bunch of our flight computers, GPS trackers, all kinds of stuff. It runs on 3.3 volts. Um, it has USB and ADC. It requires a crystal. Uh, you, you really need a very accurate time clock to talk to USB. Um, the traditional way is to just have a, a crystal in it. Crystals are expensive and big. Um, this particular chip is kind of limited, and it doesn't have a really key peripheral that I've discovered in a lot of little ARM SOCs. They're called DMA engines, and what they are is a, a, a piece of hardware that can copy data around the system. It can copy data from a peripheral into memory. It can copy data from memory to memory. It's a highly programmable copying engine, and it's really powerful. The things I've done with DMA engines in my life are kind of scary. Um, uh, I've done things like uh, I've, ge I've generated um, uh, audio streams, uh, uh, pulse width modulated audio streams. So you basically get a uh, 16-bit uh, audio stream coming out of a single pin of your SOC with two timers and a, uh, two DMA engines and no processor involvement at all. Uh, so you're able to generate just uh, you know, phenomenally complicated systems by not without using the processor at all. So a DMA engine is something I really wanted to have for this because I needed to copy data from the ADC out to the USB. And there's a lot of data involved, and I didn't really want to have the processor doing all the work. So that, this, that was the first one we used. Um, it's because it was the smallest one I had, and I'm really looking for a small package. Um, the final, I'm going to show you the final device in a while. Um, so here's the first SOC circuit. The awesome part about SOC is, is you don't need any components to drive an SOC, right? The whole point of an SOC at this level is that it's completely integrated. And in fact, the only, the only expensive component in here is a crystal. And the crystal is, let me see if I can operate this again. The crystal is this little piece up here, right? You got a 12 megahertz crystal and a couple of capacitors. That takes an enormous amount of board space and it costs money. Um, I think that crystal cost me like 50 cents. Uh, compared to the processor, the processor costs like a dollar and thirty cents, right? So here you have uh, the crystal, uh, which is all it's doing is buzzing. It's co costing a significant fraction of the entire cost of the circuit. Um, and this has uh, USB, and it has uh, um, this debug port over here that I use to talk to the to my uh, debugging system. The awesome part about ARM SOCs at this level is with this little four-pin connector over here. I can connect it up to GDB and have source-level debugging of my embedded system, which is just awesome. Uh, compare this to the Atnel solution, where you basically have printf debugging. And no, I'm not kidding. So if you've ever programmed in the Arduino environment, it's like the only thing you can do is send data out in the serial port, right? Yeah, lots of heads nodding. As soon as you move to the ARM platform, you have a real compiler, 32-bit processor. Oh, and oh, by the way, you have GDB. It's like, yay! Um, I am a Linux kernel developer. Um, I do not really subscribe to the notion that printf debugging is the best thing on the planet. Um, 
I actively engage in turning on source cell debugging whenever I do kernel development. So I guess I'm her heretical in that nature. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other thing I did here is I stuck uh, a couple of, I connected the UART. Um, we, we heard uh, in the last presentation about how uh, you often have a serial port connected to your ARM for debugging when you're doing initial bring up. Well, ha, I do the same thing in tiny little, so tiny little SOCs. It turns out that getting a serial port running on an SOC is about 10 lines of code, and getting USB running on an SOC is about 200 lines of code. Uh, 200 lines of very twisty code almost all the time. Uh, let's see, anything else here? I think not. Uh, here's the first the noise source, uh, source we talked about. It has that, um, that Zener diode here, over here, that little fake Zener diode down here. Um, and it has a little transistor to try to make that a little louder. And then it has two stages of amplification. So it has two op amps going there. You'll notice that the op amps are running basically open loop, trying to amplify as much as they can. And even still, the noise we had coming out over here was you know, 10 millivolts. No, maybe, maybe it was like 40 millivolts or something. It was barely detectable on the oscilloscope. And I'm pretty convinced that almost all of that noise was just thermal noise in the rest of the circuit. And we were getting nothing out of the Zener diode. Um, so that did not work real well. Um, and as I said, we decided to go back to the drawing board um, and do something, do something different, um, which, was, which turned out pretty well. Um, the, that final open loop uh, op amp is kind of acting as a comparator, and the goal there was to just be able to feed the output of that comparator into a GPIO um, and watch ones and zeros come in, so I can get as many ones and zeros as I want. Um, um, so that op amp is taking this uh, continuous waveform that you see in purple here, uh, this kind of continuous waveform wobbling down like this, and it's amplifying the heck out of it. So they either have really loud at 3.3 uh, volts or really quiet at zero volts. And that way you can actually run it into a single GPIO um, and shift in uh, zeros and ones. And in fact, what I did on the chip is I hooked that wire up to the SPI uh, input port on the chip. So I could clock in data using the SPI peripheral at a very high data rate with using very little of the processor. And in fact, again, when I had a, a processor with a DMA engine, now I connect my DMA engine to my SPI engine and now I can just say, I want 200 bytes of random data, go. And it would go clock, 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 clock. And the data would come in and land in memory and say, bing, you have data now. So the processor, uh, the actual process of collecting random data turned into a completely, uh, completely processorless activity, which was pretty cool. Uh, let's see. So here's the first, first board that I built. Um, I build these in, at home. In my, in my, in my, uh, on my little electric griddle to uh, sort it, reflow them. Um, how many of you have done reflow like that at home? A bunch of you play with that. It, it's, it's, you know, five years ago I thought that's insane. Who would hand load a board and cook it in a griddle? And you come to conferences and like the hand, the number of hands you see go up, up oh, more and more and more. Um, the, the frustrating thing is right now I think we're at a pretty good point for hand assembly. Uh, this component is five. Uh, oops. Five millimeters square, as I said. Uh, that's the processor. Uh, up here, you can see the crystal. It's you know uh, two millimeters by four millimeters, or two by three millimeters, or something. Um, down here, you can see those op amps, and you have the the noise source up here, that little di that little Zener diode, and the transistor right below it. So you can see all the components are actually you can actually see them with the naked eye. Um, now assembling this requires a binocular microscope. Um, fortunately, uh, the delights of the internet, and you can find a binocular microscope for about $400, um, and now you can start assembling stuff at home. Now these chips have, mo uh, the CPU here doesn't have any visible leads, and that turns out to be actually pretty hard to assemble reliably at home. I, I've gotten a lot of practice at it, um, and I can do, mo most of the time they work fine. Um, if you want to start doing surface mat assembly on your own, I recommend larger packages, and I'll, we'll see a larger package in the, in, in the next couple of slides. Um, yeah, so you can keep count here. This is the first board that I loaded. Um, you're going to see a few more of these. Um, as again, again, this has that noise source that didn't work out very well. Um, you'll notice that a lot of these boards, uh, can you see the color at all there, or does it just look black? Anybody want to guess what the color actually is? Purple, yeah, Oshpark. Oshpark is an, is an outfit in, in Portland, Oregon, my hometown, uh, run by, run by uh, Lane, that actually uh, sells uh, a service of manufacturing a small number of PC boards for a very small amount of money. 
Um, I got three of these PC boards delivered to my house for about a dollar. Um, before Oshpark existed, I would go out and look at uh, uh, 33, um, what is it, cheap PCBs or 33, uh, 33 each. There's a bunch of other PC manufacturers. And you'd spend like you know, $20 per board, and you had to order a minimum of five. And so you'd think, OK, I'm going to spend $100 to prototype this thing. And then Lane came out and said, hey, I'm going to go find some excess capacity in a selection of Chinese uh, circuit board manufacturing places and see what kind of deals we can negotiate. Oh, look, how about, how about $5 per square inch for three copies? And no, you don't, it doesn't, he doesn't round up to the nearest square inch. He really does $5 all the way down to this size. And I think this board is like half an inch by, by, uh, by 5 eighths of an inch or you know, one and a half centimeters by uh, two centimeters or so. It's just a tiny little board. Um, and so it was really inexpensive. Uh, the debug pins that you saw on the last thing, uh, they're here on the, on the right-hand side. I use holes in the board for the, uh, the debug connector. Um, that works really well. It's nice in production because uh, it costs you zero dollars to put, a, put holes in the board. Um, putting an actual connector on the board, oh my god, that costs money. Connectors are an enormous pain. So I've used this particular technique uh, very successfully in a number of boards. I can recommend it. It's, I like it better than bare pads because you can actually stick wires or other pins. I actually, have, uh, I actually have a little connector that fits right into this thing, and it's pretty reliable. You don't have to build a pogo pin, uh, pogo pin can, uh, jig for every single board you build. So this has worked out really well. I like that. Um, this particular board, <coughs> oh, fortunately, it does look pretty ugly up there. This one got really messy. I started hacking at it, which meant I put a bunch of flux on it to resolder some stuff. Um, I tried to hack a bunch of resistor values. I tried to make this noise source work, and I failed. Um, I couldn't get it to, to generate anything other than uh, basic, uh, basic sine waves or square waves as, as I amplified it. Um, it was pretty, pretty dire. Uh, Oshpark is great because they're cheap. Uh, they're not terribly fast. Uh, I know for me, I live, uh, I live one day shipping uh, from the Oshpark headquarters, which is kind of awesome. Uh, down here in Australia, I suspect it's a little longer than that. I suspect the postage is a bit harder. What? Three weeks every time. Yeah, I get, I get boards reliably back in about five days. Order to, order to delivery is about five days for me, which is, <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> First world problems, or Portland, Oregon problems, I guess, yeah. Um, this thing, of course, has the 3.3 volt, volt LDO, and this one even has two LEDs. That's my output, it's awesome. I can actually, I can actually the classic SOC uh, first program is like, okay, turn the LED on. Because turning the LED on doesn't require any fancy clocks. It doesn't require any fancy device programming. It's like, OK, get the GPIOs configured to the point where I can wiggle at, a, at one GPIO line. It usually requires about six register bytes. Um, and so I put two on this for extra debugging power. <laughs> yeah. OK. Um, now I want to talk a little about, about operating systems here. Um, you wouldn't think in such a small board you'd need an operating system, but I always like writing operating systems. How many of you have written an operating system? Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Um, I wrote this particular operating system for the venerable 8051, probably about seven years ago now. Um, it doesn't really run in the 8051 anymore. It's been kind of hacked a lot. Um, it has a bunch, uh, it has layers in it, just like any other operating system. So it has the core of the operating system. And I cannot see this slide at all on my phone. That's really disturbing. Yeah. As, as device drivers, it has uh, support for the SOC applications. Uh, you can actually, it's multitasking, because multitasking is fun. Uh, it's not preemptive, because uh, preemptive adds a lot, of, uh, a lot of randomness into my system, and it makes it harder to test, so I didn't bother with that. Um, it has, uh, you can run, it's got uh, DMA, talk to the DMA engine, it's got G, uh, standard, standard I.O. support, it's got all kinds of stuff. It's a cute little operating system. I enjoy playing with it. Um, I imagine. All of you will also enjoy writing your own operating system and will not use mine, and I'm comfortable with that. Uh, everybody should have their own. It's a lot more fun. Um, let's see. Here's the firmware plan. Whoa, that's a busy slide. Um, so when you, ha uh, when, you, when you have a little embedded system, uh, you get to do everything, right? There's nothing. The, the, the chip turns on, and, the, and practically the first instruction it executes is, is the first instruction of your start routine. Uh, that means that your, uh, the contents of your RAM are completely uninitialized. Uh, all you have is the contents of your ROM because you flashed it. Um, and so you get to do things like, oh, I need to initialize my data segment. Well, I hope I save the data segment in ROM somewhere so I can copy it to, into RAM. 
I need to initialize BSS. Well, that's pretty simple. That's a mem set, not too bad. Uh, and then I need to jump into my start function and actually start uh, into my main function and start running code. Um, and then, of course, that has to go initialize the operating system and all kinds of good stuff. And by the time you've got the operating system initialized, now you can actually go write your new product. Um, in this particular case, um, I have two tasks, uh, the cooked endpoint task and the raw endpoint task. I have two endpoints in Chaos Key. You can either get cooked uh, cook, uh, bits, which are nicely whitened and very cleaned up and sanitized, or you can actually go look at the raw noise generator and see what it does. And I do that so that you can verify that the thing is not just generating pseudo-random numbers, but that the noise generator is actually working. Um, and of course, we have a, um, a program that runs on Linux that lets you suck data out of the in raw endpoint for that thing, for that purpose. Um, let's see, we get to uh, wait for the hardware, power on self, test the thing, and that takes a while. I turn on the USB device. I don't turn on the USB device until I discover that it's working, which is kind of nice, because that means if it never appears on your system, it's probably dead, um, and which, which means that you're not going to enumerate it and, and hang talking to it or, or get garbage out of it. Um, random noise generators, there's actually a FIP specification what you, for what you do, need to do in order to test them, and I implement that. Um, and the cooked endpoint task does a bunch of other stuff. It sucks ra random data out of the noise source, uh, whitens it a bit, and then dumps it over USB. And the raw one does a very similar thing, except there's not a lot of whitening going on. Uh, let's see. Here's the second SOC. Well, this SOC is bigger. I was trolling around on the data sheets. I mean, here, here, here's an evening's entertainment for me. It's uh, going off to microcontroller websites and looking at their new products. It's like, oh. Here's a cute little one, STM32FO42. It's a Cortex-M0 processor, just like the previous one, but it's from ST instead of NXP. I like ST a little better than NXP because when I posted on the NXP forum about how to use the ST debugging dongle with the NXP processors, they deleted my post. <laughs> it's like, I'm helping people use your product. What part of this do you not like? <laughs> so I try to, I tr I've kind of shifted away from them uh, the ST people are cool with the fact that somebody reverse engineered the debugging dongle and there's now free software that talks to it and it's all very much, uh, all, all a lot of fun. There's actually two projects you can use open OCD or the ST-Link stuff um, and I kind of use a mix because uh, ST-Link worked first but open OCD is in general kind of nicer. Um, but this processor came out a couple years ago now um, and it has a couple of really nice advantages architecturally over the uh, NXP processor. It's got a DMA engine, which I really like. Um, it has a uh, high-speed clock that'll run the thing at 48, meg uh, 48 megahertz clock, uh, slaved off of the USB uh, port. USB gives you this one kilohertz pulse most of the time uh, of, are you there, are you there, are you there, are you there, um, uh, telling, asking if, if you have a packet ready for it. And this device actually uses that very reliable one kilohertz pulse to generate its 48 megahertz internal clock so that you know because it's slave to the USB, that its <laughs> clock is accurate enough for the other guy to be able to talk USB to you. So this is kind of awesome. All of a sudden, I don't need a crystal because I have this one kilohertz source. It has a DMA engine. The, this particular package is that 32-pin uh, QFP. Rather. And the nice thing about this is you can see the pads. <laughs> so when you, when, you, when you build this thing by hand, it's like, hey, just pick it up and put it down. It's, it's a no-brainer. It doesn't take any thought at all, which is kind of cool. Which meant for prototyping, it's awesome. The problem is it's freaking enormous. This thing is like seven millimeters square, plus the fact that the, the leads stick out the sides. I mean, it takes in an absolutely astonishing amount of board area. Um, completely unacceptable. Um, yeah, but on the data sheet, I saw that they were, pla they were also had, quote, for sale, a 28, a 28 lead QFN at four millimeters square. So it's even smaller than the LPC processor. And it's like, woo, I can build boards that are even smaller. Uh, of course, when I went to order the 28 lead QFN, it's like, oh no, that one is not orderable yet. Um, lead time is uh, 28 weeks and uh, you have to order a reel, which is like 5,000 parts. It's like, I just want to try it. <laughs> So I was kind of bummed. I really liked the processor. I really liked the fact that it was uh, STM instead of NXP. I liked the uh, feature set, um, but I didn't really like the package. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? So what did I did? What I what I did is I put together a new board with this design. Uh, because that old noise source didn't work, I decided to come up with a new noise source. So in early early 2015, um, I I went to the one RNG site and stole their uh, stole their noise source design. 
Um, then I trolled around the internet and discovered that there's like 50 projects that use exactly the same design. Uh, with slight variations in resistor values and capacitance values and wiring differences, this is the one RNG design um, that works quite well. Uh, it's kind of funny, it's, as I said, it's using that, uh, that uh, base two um, uh, emitter, um, is it wired wrong? I don't remember, in any case. Um, uh, it uses that, that, the same junction. Um, and then the second half of this dual transistor package is just being used to amplify it a bit, uh, get its voltage up a little bit. And then there's another 2N3904 to amplify that some more, and a little capacitor to do some DC blocking so that I can get something that's not, uh, not got a whole pile of 20 volt DC sitting in it. So here we are, happily running, uh, outputting random bits at a, a pretty phenomenal rate. Uh, one RNG used this at like 100 kilobits per second, I think, which is pretty awesome. That's a lot of bits. Um, I wanted a lot more. Um, the USB pipe uh, will hold about 800, 900 kilobytes per second of data. And I was thinking, well, I should be able to fill that um, because the processor certainly can. So I, all you need is a noise source that gives me the, uh, the, band, the noise bandwidth of, of about two megahertz. And so this wasn't quite there. It was actually quite effective. I actually was able to get a bunch of random data out of this. Um, it worked pretty well. Uh, I have a huge list. Um, I'll make the slides available. Um, and I have a huge list of links for other projects that use the same design. Uh, so it was nice to know that I was, uh, I was in good company. Um, it's, it's like an open source project. When you have 30 committers to a project, you think, yeah, that's probably pretty alive. Uh, you see one design that some guy thought might work. So you see some project that's three years old and there's, there's no commits in the last three years. It's like, eh, a little dodgy. So I was much happier with this particular design. Uh, it works quite well. Um, of course, I needed a high voltage supply. The awesome part about the one RNG design is they had the number on the part wrong, uh, which was a little frustrating. Uh, so I went and fa figured out what part they did use um, and built the same high voltage supply. It generates about 20 volts. Um, it's huge. Again, it is generating 20 volts. And it has a 10 micro Henry inductor. My god, the thing is enormous and tall. <clears throat> and the diode is also large because it's a high voltage diode. Um, and then, of course, we hook that into the second board. Uh, the second board is too big now. Now it's a lot bigger than that first board. It has that enormous SOC. Um, it has the noise source, which is also kind of large. And it still has two LEDs, because you know, green and red, they're kind of pretty. Uh, and it has the same pins for debugging. So this actually works very much like the old board, except now the noise source works, which is awesome. It's like, it's like yay, we have a design that works. Um, I accidentally connected the noise source to both the SPI input and the, the same pin would also do at ADC. So I was able to look at the raw output of the noise source to see what it was like in the analog domain, which was great. Um, There's no crystal in the board, of course, because remember, this processor doesn't need a crystal. Um, um, now, the other thing that I tried on this board that did not work out is this, you'll note this board has, has no USB connector anymore. It's just got these pads on the board. This is a terrible idea. If you see boards that do this that are big and stick out of your machine, just run away. Um, it, the, the PC board material you can get uh, for cheap is not quite thick enough. I've seen a couple of boards do this successfully, and they obviously ordered a custom thickness PCB material, which makes it work a lot better. This one, I actually dumped a bunch of solder on the, connect, on the contacts just to make it work at all. On the back side of the bo this board, I, I glued on a piece of plastic to make it thicker, and it's like, yeah, I ain't doing that in production. That ain't happening. Uh, but I wanted, I was interested in, in finding out how I can make it cheaper, right? Uh, cost of goods is a very important factor in, in how much you're going to be able to sell something for. Uh, that was not, that particular experiment was not worth it because it was going to cost me more to make the thing work than it was going to be to put the real connector on the board. So I, I gave up, this is the only board that I did that on. Um, because I connected it to the analog input of the chip, I was able to discover that the, uh, that the noise source wasn't, uh, didn't have enough bandwidth for me um, and wasn't as, wasn't as loud as I really wanted. Um, so uh, the bandwidth problem was probably caused by the transistor amplifier at the end. Um, it just didn't have enough bandwidth coming out of the transistor. I was tra am trying to amplify it too much uh, for what that transistor could do uh, bandwidth-wise. Here's a third board. Uh, you'll notice there are very few components on this board. And the reason was because I'm a software engineer. And I said, oh, yeah, let me just hack up the little board a little bit. Um, this, one had, this one, I wanted to get rid of that fake USB connector. Um, and I wanted to replace that transistor amplifier with an op amp. So I redesigned the circuit. I relayed out the board and said, oh, cool, I'm done now. I'm going to ship it off to Oshpark. 
And then about two hours later, it's like, oh, rats, I wired this up completely wrong. <laughs> and so Oshpark doesn't let you take back, like no take backs. Uh, so I sent out another board uh, that did actually work. Um, now, so I've got all these nice boards, and I've got all this, I've got this processor. Now, I want to be able to sell this to people, and I want to be able to let people use this uh, reliably. Um, a bare board connected to a, uh, to a machine is likely to get stuff spilled on it. It's likely to get dropped and have things broken. Uh, we do sell bare, bo bare boards for rocketry, and we tell people, look, be careful. This has got like raw electronics sitting out here. If you drop, if you pour your coffee on it, it's going to be destroyed. Um, so we wanted to put our components in a box. Uh, boxes and enclosures are really hard to find. Uh, uh, very few people make boxes. Um, what you can do on Alibaba or some of the other um, Chinese uh, sites is you can find surplus boxes from projects that failed. And you can find a couple hundred of them, maybe a couple of thousand of them. If you're going to build something in production, you need to be able to find a box that you're going to be able to buy more of because you put an enormous investment into building a, a PC board that fits inside of the box. So you want to be able to buy more of the same box. I have friends come up to me and say, oh, look, I found this collection of a dozen boxes for free. Uh, do you want to design your components to fit in these dozen boxes? It's like, no. I'm willing to spend $20 per box in order to have something that just works with my electronics that I can buy more of when I make, need more electronics. So enclosures are hard. Um, this is the first box that I tried. Uh, it's way bigger than the board that I just showed you, but it was the smallest box that I could find that I could, rep that I could buy more of um, that was, would fit the electronics. And so I designed a board to fit in that box, and here's that fourth board. Again, you'll note there are very few components in this. Um, again, I discovered that uh, just after I relayed it out, oh, rats, I, re I, com I wired it completely wrong. You can't often fix miswiring problems on boards like this. It's really tedious and I'm really lazy, and I'd rather just put the components on, and Oshpark is fast and cheap for me. So the fifth board. Um, oh, right. Um, at this point, I decided to switch from that transistor amplifier to an op-amp amplifier, because transistors are hard. As I said, B. Dale is the person in the, in the team that has the double E degree. He's the one who can actually make transistor amplifiers work at multiple gigahertz. He's done it many times. He's bounced signals off the moon. Um, I took a one semester course in college my freshman year about how to build op amps in a physics lab. Um, how to use op amps. Uh, op amps are really simple. There's a simple theoretical model you can use, and I've actually successfully built op amp circuits. And I have demonstrated that I cannot successfully build transistor circuits. So as BDA was off saving the world at HPE, um, I decided to, to replace the transistor amplifier with an op amp because I knew I could probably make it work. Um, and you can kind of do things with impunity as long as you work within a few small parameters. So here's the third noise, noise source design. You'll notice it's very similar uh, with one key change. It now has an op amp instead of the uh, transistor amplifier. The op amp is set to a gain of 100 because the noise source was putting out about 20 millivolts and I wanted about 2 volts uh, peak to peak uh, so that I could uh, feed it into my, into my uh, chip. Uh, the op amp, of course, I needed a gain of 100. I wanted 2 megahertz of bandwidth. So you need a gain bandwidth product in your op amp of 200 megahertz. Awesome. You go to DigiKey, you look for 3.3 volt op amps that have a GBP of 200 megahertz, and you pick the cheap one that's really small. And that was my entire op amp selection criteria. Really simple. Um, I wanted an instrumentation amplifier that was reasonably lin linear, and I didn't care if it was rail to rail. So those are some other buttons that I clicked in, 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 uh, in DigiKey. DigiKey is a great way to select parts. Um, unfortunately, they often guide you to parts that are no longer being made or you know, other, other things. But you can click buttons eventually, and if you get good at it. Uh, how many of you are, are experienced DigiKey parts selectors? Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's a skill. It really is a skill, and you learn how to use their tool. Uh, their tool is better than Mouser's tool. At least I can use it more effectively. So here's the fifth board design. Here, well, up to five boards, and I don't even have any uh, working electronics yet. Um, yeah, software designers doing hardware. Um, this time I decided to put an actual connector on for the debugger. I had this enormous PC board. I was no longer space constrained. It's like, oh, I'm going to use the enormous connector we put on our giant boards, uh, which is more convenient to uh, connect stuff to. It's a little more reliable than little holes. Um, it's, it's exactly the same, just a different connector. Um, now, at this point, I have actual working electronics. The circuit worked, the op amp worked, I get enough noise, it's nice and linear, it's like, woohoo, a year and a half into my design and I have working electronics. I'm an awesome electronics designer. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but now I've finished actually building a piece of electronics that works. So I've done the first 80% of the work, right? Now I get to do the other 80 or 90% of the work, which is to say building a, something I can sell. Um, uh, so finally, STM decided to come out with a processor that was the, the one that I hoped for, the four millimeter square one. This is a picture of it on the board. Um, it looks really huge on the screen. It's only four, four millimeter square and has uh, 28 leads. Um, I liked it, this processor so much that we're switching a bunch of our other stuff from the NXP to this thing, because it's a really nice little processor. Uh, third SOC, come along, you can change the page. Uh, and then, because I use a smaller SOC, I decided I could use a smaller box. And here's that smaller box. Um, here's the box in, in uh, the actual size. It's a really nice, tiny little box. It has a bunch of advantages. Um, it no, it's no longer so wide that if you had two USB connectors side by side, you, would, you can use both of them now, which is nice. Um, the only colors that came in when I, when I first saw it was white and black. Um, and they were both opaque. And I was, my plan was to drill a hole in the box to be able to see the cute little LED to tell you if the thing was working or not. Um, I decided that was insane. Drilling holes in boxes takes a bunch of time, makes a bunch of mess. And so I called up the manufacturer of the box and I said, OK, how much would it cost for, for me to get some of these in translucent plastic instead of opaque plastic? And they said, well, it's going to cost you about 50 cents more. And at that point, I could, do some, I could do some pretty simple math. OK, how long does it take me to drill a hole in each box? Um, and, it, and how much am I going to charge in order to drill the holes in that box? And I was like, uh, I would charge more than 50 cents per box because it probably takes me a minute per box. And I, I think I should probably be making more than um, $30 an hour. Uh, so I decided to just spend 50 cents on a better box. Um, that's an important lesson. Um, when you are costing out products, make sure you pay yourself for the manufacturer of the products. Don't just pay the person who makes the boards. And that makes choices like this a lot easier. Uh, so the, uh, now I just redesigned that same board with a new processor uh, for the smaller box. Uh, so this is exactly the same circuit. And this time, uh, it actually worked. The problem that I had with this one, um, I, uh, well, this one didn't work, as you can tell. There's no components on it. I miswired one of the leads going to the SOC, and it was right under the SOC. And it's like, oh, I can never fix that. So I had to do another board. A seventh board. This is worse than the castle in the swamp, right? The seventh one. That one stood up. <laughs> yeah. So here's the seventh board, same as the last, just a little bit better. This one actually worked, and I made a whole bunch of these. I probably made 20 of these by hand um, and sent about to a bunch of friends. I think I sent one to Greg KH so he could play with it. I sent to other, other people so they could analyze them. I sent one to Dan Klein so he could see if it was random, and I had a lot of good fun. I had to switch the LDO, the 3.3 the volt regulator, to this really tiny package. You can't really see that. Of course, it's clear on my screen. Um, but it's this little tiny package down here, this new LDO. Everything else is the same, and it worked br brilliantly. And as I said, I made a bunch of those. So this is the design we went with, um, and we made a bunch, a bunch of these. Uh, then, I, of course, I had to find a production facility. Uh, fortunately, Grant Likely had recently made a bunch of boards with seed and had a good time. Uh, so I contacted the same representative. We spent about three months reworking the design, refactoring the design, shrinking the design a little bit, and coming up with a bunch of cha minor changes that didn't change the, um, uh, um, the uh, you know, it didn't change the electronics, but made it manufacturable. Uh, they wanted to be able to snap the boards apart instead of cut them apart because it's a lot faster, um, and that meant moving components in from the edges. Uh, they thought that the traces that I ran between the, uh, between the hole and the edge of the board were a little scary for them. Uh, they thought the components were too close to the edge, and so we went from barely manufacturable to easily manufacturable with very few changes. It was awesome. But all this was feedback from that supplier, which was great. Got some production boards back for them. Oh, look, they work, because there's no real substantive changes. Uh, but they, they assembled these by hand. Um, uh, but they could, they, they, they promised to be able to make them in quantity. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, and then, of course, we got a bunch back. Does it fit in the box? Oh, look, it fits in the box. Uh, the routed ones that they made by hand fit very neatly. The ones that they v, uh, v groove and snapped apart, I had to kind of sand the edges because the V grooving was a bit rough. Uh, so there is a little bit of uh, post, uh, post board stuff that I still have to do, which is kind of annoying. Um, so the nice thing about this processor is when you plug it into USB, um, it actually comes up with a bootloader. 
So the manufacturing process for the boards of my house is to take the board, plug in a USB, run a program, which puts uh, my bootloader on it and puts the operating system on it, and then tests it. So it's literally plug it in and push a button, and it's tested and ready to go or fails. That takes about four minutes per board, which means I do five in parallel, and I've got some packaging to do, and I can probably do, you know, a hundred of these in an hour. Uh, so I'm charging like, you know, I'm charging a very small amount of money per board to get them ready for manufacturing. Uh, and that's pretty much, that's what it looks like when it's closed up. And I even have a cute little label. Uh, the label is actually a standard return address label from Avery, because custom labels cost a fortune. Uh, but I can laser print labels for really cheap at my house. Uh, and I think we probably have no time for questions, right? One minute left, okay. Uh, this was uh, some advice I have, I have a bunch more advice. But uh, thank you very much for being here. and. Uh, I'll meet you, see you at the Penguin Dinner. Um, I do have some of these for sale uh, here if you want to buy them. Um, I've been donating about half the money I've been receiving uh, to the raffle, so at least to know you're doing, uh, doing things for a good cause. Uh, thank you very much for your attention this afternoon, and I'm sorry I ran uh, so long that we don't have time for questions. Keith, the, um, the committee would love you to have this, this token of their thanks for your time and your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much.